Each year, scientists, researchers, and everyday people make incredible discoveries, helping us to better understand the world around us. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at interesting discoveries. NOAA finds weird lines of holes in the mid-Atlantic floor. As we have already established, there is plenty lurking beneath our waters. In late July 2022, a team of scientists uncovered a peculiar set of holes along the floor of the Atlantic Ocean that we are yet to find an explanation for. A team of researchers were exploring an underwater submerged mountain range when they found the holes. These are an odd series of dots forming near straight lines across the base of the ocean floor. It was on July 23rd that this discovery was made, and since then, professionals have been asking whether these are creating trails, designs, or some other sort of significant pattern. It has been NOAA Ocean Exploration that set on the mission to explain this unusual finding. A representative of NOAA Ocean Exploration explained that the holes look like they could be made by us humans, though they are surrounded by small piles of sediment that seem to indicate they have been excavated in some manner. They were also described as sublinear. They have not ruled out that these holes may have already been reported on, though we are still none the wiser regarding where they came from or how they were made. The team were in the midst of a dive to investigate around the summit of Azores, an underwater volcano. They were at a depth of 1.7 miles when these holes were found. The NOAA scientists have been mapping the deep water areas of the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone, Mid-Atlantic Range, and Azores Plateau. Not too much is known about these waters, though this mission and developing our knowledge of the area is part of the Voyage to the Ridge 2022 expedition. Scientists have encouraged members of the public to take part in posing theories and speculating what might be at the root of these mysterious holes. One person asked if an animal or object could be within the holes, another suggested methane gas, and another the possibility of underground springs. Scientists just found mountains of sugar hidden in the ocean. The wording sugar in the ocean is sure to puzzle the average person, but in this case refers to the wonderful aquatic plant known as seagrass. Within them, seagrass meadows store incredible amounts of sugar, something that has remained a secret until now. Within the seabed of seagrass hides an estimated 32 billion soda cans worth of sugar. This was discovered by a team of researchers in Bremen, Germany, who found that seagrass meadows infuse their seabed with large amounts of sugar as a byproduct. Further lab analysis revealed that seagrass seabeds possess 80 times the amount of sugar than ordinary seabeds. Seagrass itself is a valuable aquatic asset. Oftentimes under seas and oceans, it can be the lone flowering plant in vastly oceanic landscapes. It's invaluable for us as humans too, as it stores twice as much emitted carbon than forests, and to sweeten its appeal, seagrass envelops it at a rate 35 times that of trees. That makes seagrass meadows one of the most efficient techniques for battling the build-up of carbon dioxide on our planet, and the best option for what researchers called global sinkholes for CO2. Manuel Lebec the head researcher from the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology stated, To put this into perspective, we estimate that worldwide there are between 0.6 and 1.3 million tons of sugar, mainly in the form of sucrose in the seagrass seabed. The sugar is produced during the natural process of seagrass undergoing photosynthesis. They consume the sugar, sucrose to be precise, to upkeep their metabolism. However, whenever there is a surplus of sunlight, the seagrass, instead of wasting the excess sugar, stores it for further use inside the seabed that it can reach to when sunlight is low. Something that has confused scientists is why microorganisms are not swarming the seabed to consume the sucrose. Sugar is notably the easiest mineral for microbes to devour. Maggie Soggin, an author of the study, claims, What we realized is that seagrass, like many other plants, release phenolic compounds to their sediments. Phenolics are present in products such as coffee, fruits, and red wine. They have antimicrobial properties which keep the microbes away. In an experiment where they tested microbes under sugar in a non-phenolic setting, to a phenolic setting, less sucrose was consumed by the microbes in the phenolic setting. 
Despite the miraculous properties of seagrass, it's categorized as an endangered plant. If there were more of them, we would be able to store significantly more carbon dioxide residue, which would undoubtedly help ease global warming and possibly reverse climate change, but the lack of them severely wounds that chance. Lebeek said, Looking at how much blue carbon, that is carbon captured by the world's ocean and coastal ecosystems, is lost when seagrass communities are decimated, our research clearly shows. It is not only the seagrass itself, but also the large amounts of sucrose underneath live seagrasses that would result in a loss of stored carbon. When seagrass meadows are destroyed, the microbes are able to degrade the seabed. This process releases more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere instead of keeping it locked away. Lebeek estimates that around 1.54 million tons of CO2 would be released into the skies globally should more of these meadows fall. Amazon activists mourn the passing of Man of the Hole, the last of his tribe. Brazil has some of the last remaining fully indigenous tribes in the world. These tribes are preserved in their own world, away from our highly technical modern society. One such tribe was the tribe of the Man of the Hole. In the Rondonia state, on the Tanaru land, the tribe lived and slowly depleted in population as the decades passed. The final and last member of this tribe, the aforementioned Man of the Hole, was found dead inside a hammock this August. FUNAI, the Brazilian organization tasked with protecting indigenous lands and tribes, keeps tabs on these places and individuals from a distance to observe them and ensure their safety. The tribal man obtained his title as the Man of the Hole due to the countless deep holes he had often been seen digging. It is thought he passed away from natural causes at the estimated age of 60, with no evidence to suggest it was anything else. The man of the hole was thought to have lived in complete and utter isolation for at least 26 years, without a single companion or friend to keep him company. According to research and advocacy director for Survival International, Fiona Watson, no outsider knew this man's name, or even very much about his tribe, and with his death, the genocide of his people is complete. Now we may never know the truth about this ancient tribe. Their customs and culture are lost forever. Greedy ranchers slaughtered most of the man's tribe in the 1970s. The ranchers were looking to expand their land. Only he and six other tribe members survived this carnage. But in 1995, illegal miners invaded their area and took the lives of the remaining six, leaving him as the tragic sole survivor. Outside communication was attempted by organizations trying to reach out to him, but these attempts were returned with understandable aggression given that his only experiences with outsiders were brutal. The man set traps and aimed weapons at those attempting to reach out to him. Survival International employee Sarah Schenker stated, rejecting contact with outsiders was the man in the hole's best chance of survival. According to Schenker, he was the last of his tribe, and so that is one more tribe made extinct. Not disappeared, as some people say. It's much more active and genocidal a process than disappearing. Although the tribe is now gone, activists are calling for action and lands with remaining indigenous tribes to be made permanently protected. The best thing we can do for the lost tribe and the man in the hole now is to remember them and mourn their passing but also to ensure that such things do not happen to future tribes. The Brazilian Amazon is burning again. 2021 saw a huge number of wildfires, with wildfire season typically falling between June and August. Our news screens were filled with reports of the forests coming down. Experts anticipated a dangerous and frightening fire season, thanks to a partially dry year, though nothing quite prepared us for the flames spreading through our forests. Unfortunately, the Brazilian Amazon was not spared in this flurry of flames. By June 3rd, in only a matter of weeks, there had been nine significant fires reported in the Brazilian Amazon, the first of which was on May 19th, 2021. All nine of these particularly major fires took place by the border of Cerro Ricardo France State Park in Mato Grosso. The Amazon Conservation Association's monitoring of the Andean Amazon Project, or MAP, 
is what has allowed us to pinpoint the location, finding the affected area to be along the edge of the Amazon. The fires spread for an average of 494 acres. For reference, this is roughly the size of Monaco. Marcelo Salucci, a meteorologist who works in the Disaster Monitoring Center of Brazil's National Space Research Institute, explained that the rainy season, which was over by the time the fires began, was not a good one. With minimal rain, we can anticipate that the fire season would have been bad. Each fire was on land that had been deforested in 2020, emphasizing the clear correlation between deforestation and the increase in wildfires. We need to be aware of the impact our actions are having upon the world around us. Deforestation is damaging enough to our environment, removing carbon stores and releasing greenhouse gases, but for these areas to then be more vulnerable to wildfires is far more damaging than the initial deforestation might indicate. Matt Finer, a senior research specialist and director of MAP, described this as a very strong link. Expanding upon this by saying it's not a wildfire problem every year, it's a deforestation followed by a fire problem every year. The forest is often cut during the wet season, which falls from December through to April, before it is then burned throughout not just wildfire season, but the dry season from May to October. This is a favorable system for those looking to take advantage of the deforestation, those looking to convert their land to agricultural purposes for farmers and for land grabbers, people looking to unlawfully seize land. This pattern of deforestation then being followed by excessive wildfires is clearly evidenced through satellite images. 2020 saw staggering statistics for the Amazon rainforest, with more than 2,500 major fires tearing through the forest. Fires don't naturally occur in the area, as the conditions are not right. We need a dry year, and something to initially start the fire. More often than not, the fires are the result of human fires, whether it is an agricultural fire that has spiralled away after being poorly controlled, or people specifically trying to clear the land and so starting a fire to do so. Researchers have estimated that 5.4 million acres of the Brazilian Amazon's rainforest was burned in 2020, spanning roughly the size of the country of Wales. New Cracks in the International Space Station Humans have always been intrigued by the cosmos. Its beauty, wonder and majesty have captured human eyes and imagination for millennia. It's no wonder why. Space is the ultimate manifest destiny, an unknown frontier full of awe and mystery, practically begging to be explored. In a relatively short period of time, humans have pushed past the atmosphere, landed on the moon and even placed a rover on Mars. However, sometimes we forget how unforgiving space can truly be. The International Space Station is a multinational spacecraft designed for the purpose of housing humans, conducting research and performing science experiments. Though only the size of a large house, people have consistently lived on the International Space Station since 2000. Since the ISS was only supposed to last for 15 years, it has survived significantly past its projected expiration date. However, fissures or cracks have recently been discovered on the International Space Station's Zarya module. The Zarya module of the functional cargo block was the first module of the International Space Station to launch. Launching in 1998, it is the oldest piece of the ISS and is a Russian segment. Fortunately, the Zarya module is only used for storage, so these fissures aren't immediately threatening to any human life nor the rest of the ISS. However, Vladimir Solovyov, a Russian rocket engineer and specialist, has said that these fissures could begin to spread over time. These current fissures could spread across the rest of the Zarya module, eventually destroying it, rendering it completely useless within the next couple of years. And if that isn't bad enough, there is a deeper worry. If the Zarya module, the oldest part of the ISS, is beginning to show its age, it's likely that other parts of the ISS will start to do the same. If the cracks persist, the ISS may become uninhabitable, and the invaluable research taking place there may come to a halt. Of course, another ISS could be designed, built and launched, but such a feat would require a massive international effort, not to mention billions of dollars. All we can really do now is hope that the International Space Station lasts as long as possible so that our burning space questions can continue being answered.
but what do you make of these recent discoveries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.